Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. We have not really spent a lot of time together the last, what, month? We haven't even been in the same hemisphere. Yeah, that's right. I don't think we've been in the same country for a long time. Yeah, I went to Portugal, then Spain. I came home and you immediately turned around and went to Portugal. I mean, we could have been there together. We could have been, but the one true band, Marillion, as you all know, they had a weekend, three concerts over three nights, and I couldn't wait to get there. It was fantastic. Anyway, what's new and exciting in your world this week? Jonathan Lamberson, one of our listeners, sent an article that he wrote about Gainesville, Florida's lack of affordable housing. Or I should be more specific, what Gainesville, Florida's local government is doing about the lack of affordable housing. Low-income housing has been torn down over time and replaced with higher-income housing. Rents are rising. And Jonathan talks about Gainesville's focus on what they're calling inclusionary and exclusionary zoning. Inclusionary zoning appears to be local government taking deliberate action to push the market to provide low-income housing. They've said they should have 10% of new rental units priced at, quote, affordable rates. The other 90% can be priced at market value. Now, how you engineer that, I don't know. Because if you tell a builder, look, 10% of these apartment units have to go at some affordable rate, name the number, whatever it is, all that's going to happen is the builder is going to build down to get to that number. So I don't know what kind of quality apartment you're going to have at the end. But nonetheless, this is inclusionary zoning. Exclusionary zones appear to be the opposite. It's what happens when you leave the market alone. You get a natural bifurcation of low-income and higher-income housing. I tend to be somewhat skeptical of zoning rules. However, you could imagine that there are probably good zoning rules and bad zoning rules. And good zoning rules I would classify as rules that are intended to protect property rights. So you don't want a business setting up that produces noxious fumes or pig farm right next to a school or something like that. And I can understand zoning laws like that that are intended to protect property rights. But then you get other zoning rules that are kind of intended to ensconce the existing owners. So you would say things like there's going to be a minimum lot size. If you're going to build a house, you've got to have whatever it is. Let's pick a number, an acre of land. Well, what you've automatically done there is shut out low-income housing because you can't afford to build an affordable house if you also have to have one acre per house. There are laws that are restricting micro-houses. Rules like that, zoning rules that would prohibit people from using their own property in whatever way they see fit, I would classify that as a bad rule as opposed to zoning rules that prevent people from using their property in such a way that they impose harm on somebody else. Those would be good zoning rules. Zoning laws have all kinds of weird effects. For example, they separate businesses from housing. You see these things where places are zoned residential or zoned retail, When you separate businesses from housing, you make it more expensive for shopkeepers. If I can't live above my shop, I now not only have to commute a long distance, but my shop is now not protected when I'm not there. Humans living in proximity, this is a complex system. You've got tens of thousands of moving parts. No single objective is apparent. You know, safety is important, but so too is style and the age of your home and the vibe and the age of the neighborhood and, of course, price. And the ranking of those multiple objectives is different for each person. So I would say, look, how to arrange housing is a problem that's apparently custom built for spontaneous order. And I would say, generally speaking, not in all cases, but generally speaking, any attempt by a local government to dictate what housing should look like is simply going to make things look worse. This is that point in the episode where I say, that's great, but all of that was very boring. (laughs) I want to make the people absolutely aware of the fact that we do not get together before these shows to figure out what we're going to talk about, because the headline I'm working with today, affordable housing in California now routinely tops $1 $1 million per apartment to build. Oh, my God. That's affordable housing. $1 million. More than half a dozen affordable housing projects in California are costing more than $1 million per apartment to build, a record-breaking sum that makes it harder to house the growing numbers of low-income Californians who need help paying rent. There's a number put to what affordable housing looks like. 
in California, that is probably exactly right, because what has happened there, the regulatory state has gone, uh, what's that term I'm looking for, out of its mind batshit crazy. And you have to satisfy so many different masters to build anything that all that gets baked right into the cost. People see this and their knee-jerk reaction is to go to rent control. If we just hold rent down, we'll fix the problem. Assemblyman Tim Grayson, who, shock of all shocks, is a Democrat from California, that is untenable, said the assemblyman. That is not a sustainable model. We have got to do something to reduce the cost. What he should be saying is, that's right, let's get all these regulations out of this market and let people decide what they want and what they don't want. But what he really means is that we have to now lean on anybody who says this is costing X dollars because they have to be brought to heel. And then whatever can't be squeezed out of them, we must tax the rest of our citizens to pay for this affordable housing. If it's affordable, nobody pays for it except the person who lives in it. Mm -hmm. This is about to be yet another cluster in California. And they're looking for affordable housing. They just got the opposite of that. Yeah, and it seems reasonable that you hold the price low. Everyone says, well, then you get affordable housing, but you don't. What you get is a shortage of housing. Because if I've got a building and you're not going to let me charge market rates, then I'm not going to have apartments here. I'm going to convert it into business space and rent it out to someone who isn't rent controlled. California just does not have the right answers. Yeah, but they don't because they always look to the wrong source for the answer. It's always what can the government do, never what can the government stop doing. Yeah, what can the government not do is far better question at this point. But they don't even realize how many of their own edicts are baked into the price of housing. California demands that all new housing starts include solar power. It multi tens of thousands of dollars. That's right. I just had the solar guys come over to the house to tell me what it would cost to get solar on my roof. One said $31,000. The other one said $35,000. If you're talking about affordable housing, I mean, you may have just doubled the price of it with that solar requirement. And where does that price trickle right to? The person who walks in to occupy the space or taxpayers. It's got to be one or the other. Kind of hard to believe that that wasn't the foolishness of the week. Did you see my rage tweets from Friday? You had airline problems as usual. Imagine that. On I'm on American Air internationally. Problems again, not with American Air, but with British Air. My daughter and I were traveling, same flights, different destinations. We got on our phones early in the morning and it said, your boarding pass is not available. Go see somebody at the desk. We're thinking, ah, oh, sh**. <laughs> we got there at 3.30 in the morning and there was already a line that was too long. Oh, wow. And we get to the front of the line and the woman says, you can't come. You don't have tickets. We said, no, no, that's why we came. See this thing on our phones says to come and see you because we don't have tickets. And she said, of course, but you don't have tickets. I can't help you. <laughs> now, this took a while. For careful listeners, it was kind of like an interaction we had one day at a parking garage where Pam introduced <laughs> herself four or five times before she stopped with the glitching. Hi, my name is Pam. Hi, my name is Pam. But anyway, we finally get our tickets and we get to where we're going in terms of getting near the plane that's taking off. And it was one piece of awful travel news after another. On that day, three different Harrigans flew American Air, and all three missed their flights. From the minute I walked out of the apartment I rented in Porto, Portugal, it took me 27 hours to get home. Oh, my Lord. So it should come as no surprise that when I'm looking at the foolishness of the week, here's the headline. Holiday weekend sees massive amount of flight cancellations. Now, I'm going to take a swipe at whoever copy edited this thing because there is not an amount of flight cancellations. There is right. only a number of flight cancellations. People who know the difference should be doing the copy editing. I digress. I'm going to read you the important paragraph of the story, but we'll leave the link in the show notes. Faced with staffing shortages and a pilot shortage in particular, many airlines have already canceled thousands of flights for the summer season, including Southwest, which cut nearly 20,000 summer flights. 20,000, according to a report from Dallas Morning News. I'm pretty sure we got caught up in that. Yeah. You know that I'm the victim of an airplane crash. When the truck ran, I don't think that counts as an airplane crash. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I was in an airplane and something crashed into us, but I digress. He was on the tarmac. Um, this, parked that's right. and a truck ran and into the plane <laughs> as i was sitting i don't remember if it was porto no it was in heathrow 
I'm looking out, and there's a bunch of guys pointing at the wing. Oh, no, that's not good. And the woman sitting next to me said, what do you think's going on? I said, I think we are about to be grounded. If one more vehicle pulls up and one more person gets out and points, we're screwed. <laughs> and within five seconds, the second vehicle pulled up, a bunch of guys, and they all started pointing. I looked at what they were pointing at, and it was a donut-sized hole in the flap. Uh oh And I said, there's no way on earth we were getting into that plane. Yep. And they herded us off, and they said, take your belongings. This was my first flight of the day. We were about an hour and a half late coming out of that maintenance, which meant I was definitionally out of luck at Heathrow and the next place and the next. Yeah. And when I got to Heathrow, there was a big, long line, and there was still the off chance I could make my flight, and the line wasn't moving. And I saw one person turn around, and I cut the whole line. I feel bad about it, but I lowered my shoulder, and I went in, and people were flying in every direction. <laughs> and the woman, oh, my God. And the woman looked at me, and I said, need boarding passes and she gave me three of them with no question whatsoever <laughs> and i took the one that i needed i ran to the door that you put it in that opens the thing and it would not open the thing it was already too late oh no so yeah that's just how it goes so all three flying harrigans were stranded by american airlines way to go people i pick on american airlines quite a bit because i have every reason to but this is the first time they have stalled a quorum of the harrigan family <laughs> to get more ant and james buy a copy of our excellent book cooperation and coercion you can find the paper and electronic versions on amazon and the audio version on audible if you'd like to support Words and Numbers, make your way over to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers, where you can contribute to our podcast-making habits. If you'd like to schedule us to come speak at your event, be it corporate or educational, or have James officiate at your wedding, send us an email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. The big thing in the news is inflation, and I kind of feel like the world has caught up with us because this is something yep. we have been warning about for years, even dating back to prior to our podcast. We would write on this repeatedly saying we're going to be hitting a period of large inflation. Here's why. And here's what we always said. I want to be real clear. We don't know when it's going to happen. We just know that it will. Yeah, consumer prices are up 9% from where they were a year ago, and it's only 9% because we're not done with the year. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's going to be going down. I don't leave the house much, which means I don't reach to my wallet all that often. But boy, I went out yesterday and took a look around, and things are getting kind of grim. You know, start off with just gas. Gas was expensive. Now it's everything. Everything yeah. is up. Well, when everything has to be shipped to market, and gas is up over $5 a gallon, and diesel way over that people point to the oil companies and they say, somebody wrote me and said, well, the problem's Exxon. Exxon made $25 billion in profit over the past year. Let me throw this question out to you, James. Two companies, Exxon and Domino's Pizza. Exxon made $25 billion profit over the past year. Domino's made $480 million. Which is the more profitable and everyone says, well, it's Exxon, of course, $25 billion compared to less than half a billion on Domino's. Yeah, but here's the thing where people completely miss. It cost Exxon $340 billion for the assets that Exxon uses to generate its profit. So that $25 billion turns out to be a 7% return on its money. You put $340 billion on the table, that produces Exxon, and it generates a $25 billion return, 7% return. And if the people got their way and the government went in and shut Exxon down, who would fill that place in the market? Probably no one. How do I know this? How many people have that many billions of dollars to get all up and running from nothing? But the right way to think of this is not in terms of how many dollars the company makes, but rather what we call the return on assets, the dollars divided by how much assets are. So 7% return is Exxon. Domino's, with its less than $1 billion in profit, 28% return. That's monstrous. Yeah, it's That's a unbelievable. fabulous That's unbelievable. return. unbelievable. Yeah. I would dare say there aren't many companies in the United States that could even come close to that. Well, I went and I picked some companies to look at, and I picked some ones that people tend to like, and I picked ones that people vilify. So the ones they vilify, Exxon, of course, Amazon and Walmart, they made each 17 and $15 billion in profit, but you look at the return on assets, it's 5%. 
It's a 5% return at Amazon. It's a 5% return at Walmart. It's a 7% return at Exxon. Domino's 28%. Apple, 29%. (laughs) And so the, the moral of that story is, look, you can't look at all of the money that Exxon's bringing in and say, well, Exxon's the reason we have inflation. The amount of money it's bringing in is relatively small compared to what's required for Exxon to exist at all. But let's go back to this 9% of inflation. What does it mean? A median household in the U.S. makes about $60,000, give or take. 9% inflation over the course of a year is the equivalent to a $6,000 pay cut. Imagine you're a median household. You took a $6,000 pay cut. That's a huge hit. That's that's the same as 9% inflation. This is what we're talking about. The vast majority of people, if they were told they're getting a 10% salary cut, would go look for another job immediately. Right. And now you could go look for a job all you want, and there are job openings all over the place, but all the same forces are at play for those other jobs too. It's the same everywhere. Now, will wages rise eventually? Yeah, they tend yeah. to rise with inflation as well, but you're talking about a lag here. You know, you're not going to get right. 9% right now. You might have to wait till next year. Meanwhile, you're out the equivalent of $6,000. Why is that? Well, your employer doesn't have the money either. It's interesting you say that because I just got an email from our university president today to all the faculty saying, yes, they're aware of inflation and all of this. They're looking to give raises to the faculty to compensate for the inflation. And I'm thinking, okay, that's great. But what's that going to do? It's going to increase tuition because that money's got to come from somewhere. And so all of a sudden the parents are now paying more. See, and now all these people say, well, we need government to fix this. Government caused this. Government's the problem here, and we've made this argument before. And what's different now is we can point to the actual things that we warned about and show you how they're playing out and how they go back to government. This whole problem comes from one thing, and that is that our federal government for decades has been spending money it doesn't have. The voters will get pissed off about this, right? And they'll say, look, we need to balance the budget and all of this. And somehow politicians always come up with excuses It's emergencies. And they'll say, look, there's this event and we've got to deficit spend because we've got to deal with this. 1980s, it was a Soviet threat. It was Reagan saying we've got to put paid to the Soviet Union, put them out of business and we've got to spend all this money on defense and it's going to bankrupt them. Let's stop right here because I want to add and thank God that was exactly the right move to make at the time. But once you've done it, you got to stop spending. That's the key. Once you're done, you then cut back. Because you remember the whole peace dividend, the money that the government wasn't going to have to spend because the Soviet Union was no longer a threat. There was no peace dividend. It just gets shunted to something else. After that was done, looking at the globe, there is no further reason to spend like that ever again. But it became the new normal, and we moved on from there. We did. That was the 80s. Along comes the 90s, and we have the savings and loan crisis which, if you recall the housing crisis in 2008, this was a similar thing with savings and loans, think banks, going bankrupt across the country. Too big to fail. Too big to fail. We've got to bail them out. That was under Bush the first. They bailed them out and they said, look, we're going to have to deficit spend. This is an emergency. If you believe in free markets, as both Ant and I do, there is nothing that's too big to fail. That's right. You play your hand, you win, you lose. Government's got nothing to do with that except guaranteeing the rules of the game. That's not to say that if some very large company failed, there'd be some ramifications. We're going to go through a little bit of pain until this gets fixed. But the pain you go through is going to be a lot less than the pain you go through when the government tries to bail the thing out. So we have the Soviet threat in the 1980s. We have the savings and loan crisis in the 1990s. Come the 2000s, of course, it's 9-11. And all of the massive spending that's there, the war on terror and so forth. I think the war on terror has cost us so far like two or three trillion something. No, I think, I think it's like five. Isn't it? But it's trillions of dollars. And then in 2010s, it's the housing crisis. And I claim we had the housing crisis Because we bailed out the savings and loans back in the 90s. We told the financial sector, you be irresponsible, and if things go bad on you, the government will bail you out. And come the 2010s, what's happening? They're being irresponsible. Why? Because they know the government will bail them out. And now we have the 2020s and we have COVID. What did we spend, like $6 trillion, $10 trillion over the past two years? We'll find out the true price tag 30 years from now, but we'll have had eight new crises between then and now. Well, I know what the 2030s is going to be. It's going to be Social Security. That's been on the radar for a long time now. It might well be the crash of our monetary system. 
Yeah, I'm not quite sure what happens there. That's going to be a big problem. That's going to be the order of COVID. One way or the other, the dollars that you now have will be worthless then because the entire system collapsed under its own wake or it's worthless because the Fed just put zeros on the dollars over time and they became less and less valuable as a result. It's either you go out with a bang or you go out with a whimper, but either way you're going out. So we have the federal government spending all of this money we don't have. And you can argue, well, imagine how bad the world would be if it didn't spend that money. And okay, fine, there's that argument, but nothing comes for free. And what's happening now is we're paying the price for this because what's different now versus pre-COVID is that the federal government has run out of places to borrow money. And we've been talking about this for the last five years, too. Yeah, we predicted we've this. warned this is going to come because the people, businesses, foreign countries, they loan, but they only have so much to loan or so much they're willing to loan. Now, the big lender to the federal government was Social Security. Starting around about 2010, Social Security didn't have any more money to lend. It needed its money back. Your biggest lender is now asking for the money back. And not only do you have to pay him back, but you've got to find somebody else to loan you the money that you need for COVID on top of everything else. This is like credit card dancing where you get a new one to pay off the balance on the old one. Then you get another one to pay up. That. And before long, nobody's left to give you a new one and you just have to pay up. This is where the story takes an interesting, well, it's interesting to an economist, an interesting turn. And that is that as the federal government has run out of places to borrow, it's had to come to rely more and more on the Federal Reserve to loan it the money it needs. And the thing that's different about the Federal Reserve versus all those other entities we talked about, the people, the businesses, the foreign countries, Social Security, what's different with Federal Reserve is when the Federal Reserve loans the government money, it does so by printing it. It increases the money supply. And that's where the inflation's coming from. Well, that's a tax on every single person who has savings in, in U.S. dollars. Economists say this all the time. We've said it repeatedly that inflation is a tax on your savings. And you're feeling that right now because you could take money out of your bank to go buy gas. And guess what? It's going to buy half as much gas as it did nine months ago. Yesterday, I lost my mind the way you do. And I said, family, let us go and see the new Doctor Strange movie. We'll get in the car and we'll go there and we'll, we'll watch the movie and then we're going to leave and we'll get dinner someplace and then we'll come home. On the way, I realized that my gas tank was empty and that stupid light was lit and the wife gets all kinds of annoyed when that happens. That's a hundred dollar proposition right there, James. It was $80. Eight zero. And then we went to the movies. The wife had gotten tickets. I don't even know what a movie costs anymore. I think it's like $10, 15 something like this. And then I went to dinner, and that was another $50. It cost me almost $200 to go see a movie. Yeah. I know I should be spreading the cost of the gas across all of my many miles, but I'm out of my pocket like $120 before I'm done with that. Versus night. an hour ago. <laughs> exactly. Take a look at the bottom line of government and understand that everything that comes from your statement, there ought to be a law that dot, 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 adds to the bottom line. Before you know it, it's out of hand. Every time we ask the government for something, it comes back to us in the form of government spending money, and now we get inflation. And I don't even want to get into state and local spending. There's a break on state and local spending that does not exist with the federal government, and that is that the states can't print money. If they don't stay in the black, they've got to convince somebody, by somebody I mean private people or businesses, citizens, whatever, to loan them the money. And the citizens or the businesses say no, then the state's just out of luck. It can't spend the money. But notice this interesting thing. The states are forced to, if not balance their budgets, stay close to balance because they can't print money. That used to be the case with the federal government when we were on a gold standard. That is, when you're on a gold standard, yes, you can print money, but you can't print more money than what you have gold. So the fact that the gold is fixed in quantity means that your money supply also has to be fixed in quantity. It's a natural economic break on the growth of government. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be gold. It could literally be anything. It could be anything. It could just be an agreement that, okay, we're not going to have more than X number of dollars. It's got to be quantifiable, observable, something that everybody can look at and say, this is the thing that we agreed to right here. Yeah. That's why gold was valuable, because people agreed that it was. Gold is no more valuable than quartz if you're dying of thirst or hunger. 
as John Locke said, a shiny yellow metal that everybody seems to like for some reason. The benefit to it is that it's fixed in quantity, and if you tie your dollar to it, your dollar is now fixed in quantity. You asked earlier what can be done to fix any of this. The Federal Reserve is now attempting to contract the money supply, or technically what it's doing is slow the growth of the money supply in an attempt to cool down the inflation. But here's the thing. When you contract the money supply like that to control inflation, you also drive interest rates up. And now we're back to the federal government because the federal government's $30 trillion in debt. As interest rates go up, the federal government's annual interest expense goes up. And here's the number that will blow a lot of people away. At $30 trillion, that's the federal debt, if interest rates rise just two percentage points, it will cost the federal government annually as much as the entire Department of Defense It would be like having a second Department of Defense. That would be the annual expense on the interest from just a two percentage point rise. I want to put a finer point on what you just said. You just said this will cost the government a lot more. No, no, no. It's going to cost all of us. Right. It's going to cost the taxpayer because the government actually doesn't have any money. (laughs) Let me put one more fine spin on things. It's the middle class taxpayer. The middle class taxpayer is the great untapped resource. The middle class together earn twice as much money as the top 1% together, but they tend to be taxed at a far lower rate. I know politicians, they're not going to say this for obvious reasons, but they're looking at the middle class knowing this is a great untapped resource. They're looking at rich people and they're saying, we're going to go after these rich people who don't pay their fair share, blah, 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 blah. And the minute the words are out of their mouths, you know it's already a lie because they're already looking at the middle class. Yeah, they're going to get us to cheer for tax on the rich. Then they're going to define down, quote unquote, rich to hit the middle class. But I submit, James, that our founders set out to conduct an experiment in limited government And I think somewhere around the 1920s, we started a new experiment in unlimited government. The experiment, if you want to call it that, I think they would have been happy to call it that, and in some cases did. The experiment of the United States of America was officially a failure as the progressive era came into being. About 100 years ago. I think we can do a separate episode on that. You know, fact of the matter is, is anybody should be able to look around and say, look, this is not what the founders gave us. Now, that sounds like a criticism, and surely it is. But we get different outcomes now, too. Different outcomes which are in many respects quite a lot better. Would you want to be a black man at the time of the American founding? And I suspect that answer is a hard no. Right. How about a woman? Would you have preferred to have been a woman? There are many things that are better. And I think we have to stipulate to that every single time we look at the failure of the words on the paper of the United States Constitution. We've gotten really good outcomes and really bad outcomes. When things are an experiment, that's what you have to expect. But I think our century-long experiment in unlimited government is ending at the same place it began, and that's Social Security. Social Security was the big thing that progressives back in the 1920s wanted. It was clearly unconstitutional. But they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed. And finally, the Supreme Court said, OK, right, even though the document doesn't authorize the federal government to do this, we're going to read a way that that can happen. And once you open that door, you've got unlimited government. And now we reach the point where we can't pay for it anymore. And the straw that's going to break the camel's back is going to be Social Security's impending insolvency, which Social Security will tell you is coming around 2032. Every great story has a beginning, a middle and an end. And we're in the end. And I'm very interested to see what comes next. I think what comes next is going to be much better, just like what came after the experiment of limited government was at the time much better. Probably, but consider this. Right now, everybody is hurting given the prices that they're facing. Those prices are going to continue to go right up. Anything that happens between now and the actual end of this story is going to be very painful. People often say they enjoy our episodes because we point to problems, but we also offer solutions. And I want to point to a solution here, and I don't think it's a tenable solution, but I'm going to point it out because I think it's the right solution. And that is voters have to stop asking for free stuff because politicians are very happy to grant whatever it is that we want and put it on the country's credit card. We have to stop asking for it. The free health care, the free tuition, the free housing. Never going to happen. But we have no one to blame here but ourselves. That is correct. 
but we're going to go down the death spiral wanting more and more and more of the things that put us there in the first place. I would encourage people to go look at the example Venezuela furnishes. Venezuela was once a very functional society. Yeah. They were firing on all cylinders there. And then the oil industry was nationalized, and you all know the story. But what ends up happening is that they get into this death spiral not more than a few years after Michael Moore was down there pointing around saying, look, this is exactly the way we should do things. They've got all the right answers. All of a sudden, you can't afford to buy anything in Venezuela, and they're weighing the currency instead of counting it when you go to the store to pay for something. Right. I would encourage you to understand that the place Venezuela ended up is exactly where we're heading. And that's all we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Be sure to join us next week when we try to find something, I don't know, marginally more uplifting than we had today. I think just about anything will do. Yeah, probably, because our handles for Twitter are in the show notes. And if you're wanting a good laugh, you should go find those. And you can also tell them about this other thing that you always talk about. The email. You can send us email. Words and Numbers podcast at gmail.com. It's cheaper than a gallon of gas. Shut up. Until <laughs> next week. When we reconvene to do the same god-awful thing, <laughs> try to be nice to each other, just just for a little bit. I know it's getting harder with each passing week, and you're going to end up paying like $30 for a bag of potato chips before it's all said and done. But at least try. Remember, it's not the cashier at the grocery store. It's not her fault that you can't afford potato chips. Just be nice to each other, at least for a bit, and maybe we'll get through this. And I'll catch you next week. See you next week, James. James.